Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Book as in Books. And welcome back to this uh, very poorly lit room that is my reading room uh, and that is at the moment a storage room of some sort. However, by the time this video is posted, chances are all the furniture and all the stuff in this room has been moved, not to its regular place, but to the big room that is currently empty. Uh, because by then the floor on in the big room will have been done and the floor in this room will be in the process of being done. So things are moving along slowly but surely. I'm very happy about that. And in the meantime, I have a book haul for you. Well, it was for me, the book haul. I bought the books for me. Um, one of my favorite stores, uh, Perfect Books on Elgin Street. Here's the address and here's the information in case you want to order books online because they have a very good service. They had a sale, 20% off everything in store. What was I supposed to do? Of course I had to support them. And also, uh, sometimes I stress eat uh, and sometimes I stress book buy. It, it, it's a healthy way to cope, I think, <laughs> more than eating because of course I'm not eating good stuff. I've been eating pizza and a lot of hot chocolates from Starbucks. I don't know how much sugar there's in there, but it's probably not pretty. Anyway, anyway, uh, this time I bought books. So when I went there, uh, at first I had sort of two ideas in mind. The first one I thought, oh, I want to buy a romance because at, at this moment it's pretty much all I can read. Um, and I had a couple of titles, a couple of authors in mind. And they do have a romance section in that bookstore. Many independent bookstores simply don't, but uh, this, this bookstore does. It's a small section. It's just a few shelves, but still, it, it, it's a few shelves. So I went to look at it and there was nothing that interested me. Uh, the main problem was that they do not carry mass market paperback romance. They just carry regular paperback romance. No hardcovers because there barely ever is any romance published in hardcover. But they, they have the bigger size books. So instead of selling you the version that is at $15, they want to sell you the version that is at $22. And the problem is that I don't necessarily reread romance or I don't necessarily expect to reread a romance book. So paying your 20 something dollars for it, I find it a bit expensive. And there was nothing that really attracted me. Uh, so I, I did not buy a romance. So I kept walking just right next to their romance section, which is right, uh, right when you enter, it's on your right, uh, right next to the door. So uh, then you continue and then you have the Penguin Classics section. And that was my second idea. I had a very specific title in mind. I wanted to buy Romola by George Eliot. And um, they had a whole bunch of George Eliot. They had Silas Minor, Middle March, The Middle on the Floss, uh, Felix Holt, Daniel Deronda, but they did not have Romola. So I was a bit, I was a bit disappointed because I figured, well, they're going to have all of George Eliot. So I didn't know what I wanted to buy because I knew I wanted to buy something 20% off. I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking advantage of that occasion. So I just kept walking in the bookstore uh, and after the classics, it's the fiction section. And nothing caught my eye because I knew that I would probably not read it right away. And for fiction, if I put it on the shelf, chances are it's going to remain there. For, for me, non -fi uh, fiction does not have the same appeal on long term than Nonfiction. A nonfiction book can stay on my shelves for quite a few months, even a few years, and I'm still going to be interested in reading it several years later. However, for the fiction, I find that the longer a book stays on read on my shelves, the less I want to read it. And while I was browsing, there was nothing that struck me as something that I wanted to read right away. So I did not buy anything in the fiction section. So I just kept walking and not really just looking at all everything that they had. And then and then my heart leapt. I saw Gilgamesh, <laughs> a new translation by Sophus Heller. Uh, Hella, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, so uh, this man is a teacher at Berlin University, well, the um, Freie Universität Berlin, so the Free University of Berlin. And he actually translated Gilgamesh. He did not translate the translation. So, so far I have read versions of Gilgamesh by Herbert Mason, David Ferry and Stephen Mitchell. And neither of them actually can read the cuneiform original. This one, he can, and that's what he did. And I actually have already started it. So that's, the, um, that's my post-it for uh, the end notes. And there's not that many end notes. So, so far, I've read the introduction. I've read the first three 
tablets um, and and I really like it so the introduction um, so there's the introduction and then there's a bunch of essays at the end and as the author author puts it the introduction is a bit what you must know and the essays at the end it's what it's nice to know so I ignored the essays at the end I may read them I may not and I decided to read the introduction like he recommends and then go straight to the um, to the text and um, it's he wrote it in poetry, he adapted it into a blank verse, but he also makes clear when bits are missing and when some verses are incomplete, he does not fill them up, he just leaves it blank. And um, that there are various versions of um, Gilgamesh that have survived, and some of them are more complete than others. So whenever he uses one version, he the one that he used the most is the... Um, is it written? It is the standard Babylonian version. So it's not, as he says, it's not the standard version of Gilgamesh. It's the version in standard Babylonian, as opposed to old Babylonian, um, and as opposed to uh, Sumerian or Akkadian or other languages. But he can read all of that. So it makes so far for a very, very good version of Gilgamesh. So far, I love it. And while I was in that section of poetry, uh, I kept an eye open for other epic poetry because I like that. And there was this book, Bright Pink, that attracted my eye. Um, so this is a deluxe penguin edition. These are the Metamorphoses by Ovid, and the translation is by Stephanie McCarter. And like all deluxe penguin, there's a bunch, there's a big introduction that is 50 pages long. Um, about no 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 not quite 30 uh so the introduction is 30 pages long and then there's a note on translation that's about five pages long and then there's suggestion for further reading that brings us to page 38 and then there are the metamorphosis the text itself and at the end there are generous notes like uh 50 pages of notes, something like that. And there's also a glossary and index of principal names and places, just in case we don't know, uh, we've lost a little bit uh, our bearings in who's who in the pantheon of Roman gods. Uh, and uh, and that's it. So it's, it's a beautiful book. Uh, and I've never read the metam Metamorphosis, whether in French or in English or by any translator. So um, this is going to be uh, interesting. I think, I hope. Next, uh, I went, uh, th this book I found in a different section, so it was not in the same poetry section. This one was in the history section. Was it in the history section? Yes, it was in the history section. It is Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts by, um, by, by Christopher de Hamel. Um, I suppose that's how he pronounces it. And this is a beautiful book full of images. Um, so the author is a, how does he call it? Is it paleologist? Is that what it's called? Paleology? Uh, people who study ancient manuscripts. He wrote it somewhere. He wrote it somewhere. Anyway, if I if I have the wrong word, I'm just going to write the correct one here. Um, and he's a specialist of ancient manuscripts. And I've read the introduction, so I've read uh, the first um, the first nine pages. It's a very very short introduction, and um, he he makes the very very good point. Whoops, the, the light is on the left. I'm going to keep the book on the right. Uh, so uh, the point that he makes is that if you have a little bit of money and you decide to go around the world to see the major works of art you will have no difficulty having access to them in museums. You're going to be able to see famous paintings, famous sculptures all over the world. However, if you want to see manuscripts, good luck. Most of them are behind, m most of them are either not shown to the public at all, or if they are, they are locked up in a small box. They will be opened at a single page uh, in very special conditions, with not a lot of light, with um, in, in very difficult conditions, and you will not be allowed to touch them, you will not be allowed to turn the page. Many of the manuscripts have been scanned, uh, photographed, uh, they, they are available online if you want to look at them, but as he says, 
the object itself can tell you a lot. So when you have just the page that is photographed, what you cannot see is this. And here is uh, what are called, I had the word just a quarter of a second ago in my mind. They are called choirs. There we go. So the, all these little sections, these little U's, they are choirs. And when you look at the book, an ancient manuscript, medieval manuscript, from that angle, you can see right away if pages are missing or if some entire choirs are missing. So you can see exactly if things are missing or not. But if you look at it online and you just have the surface of the page, you cannot see that. Um, and you can also see various other things. And he takes us to see these manuscripts. So he chose 12 manuscripts. Several of them are religious, some of them are not. And I'm very excited to see what he's going to tell us about these manuscripts. Obviously, he will not just copy the content of the manuscript. That's not it. Um, he calls them a bit interviews with the manuscript. So he's going to try to have these manuscripts reveal their lives to us. So it sounds absolutely delightful. And the same author published a book last year, which was The Manuscript Club. Uh, so that one is not in, it is still in hardcover. So I decided not to buy the hardcover, even though it was there. Uh, I have a hold on it at the library. I'll probably get it in June. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, so anyway, th this sounded just fascinating. And then my last two little buys, they were last minute buys. Uh, I had the three books in my hand and I figured, okay, that's enough. And I thought, wait a minute, this is 20% off everything. I might as well stock up a bit on Shakespeare. So I bought a couple of Shakespeare plays. Uh, this one is Macbeth. I have actually never read Macbeth. I've never read Macbeth. I know the story. I know what it's about. I know a couple of its most famous scenes, like a floating knife, like witches and things like that. But I've never read it. So I had that in stock. And the other one, I decided to go for one that I know nothing about. And this is Twelfth Night. I have no idea what it's about. Um, and I think it's one of these, uh, these plays that is neither a tragedy nor a comedy. It's a bit in the middle. So I thought that could be interesting. I've never read any of these plays by Shakespeare. I think another equivalent would be The Tempest or uh, A Winter's Tale. Uh, yeah, Winter's Tale. Um, I think um, they are these... These plays are not tragedies, but they're not comedies. They're in, the, in between. So um, th that would be a new aspect of Shakespeare to me. So I, I bought this one. So they, that was the only edition that they had. This is the, uh, the Pelican Shakespeare. So th these are penguins. Penguins. Uh, but it's called Pelican. So I think it's for a younger audience. They have a picture, a photograph. And then, uh, let's see, content, publisher's note on page seven, the theatrical world on page nine, the text of Shakespeare on page 25, introduction on page 29, note on the text on page 49, and then finally, Twelfth Night, or what you will, that starts on page one, <laughs> because all the other numbers I gave you are in Roman numerals. So there you go, that's the table of content. And the presentation is thus. So with a number of footnotes uh, rather than endnotes. Um, and they were not very expensive. They were $13.50. So with 20% off, that's less than $10. So I thought that was a good deal. Um, so that's it. That's the end of my little book haul that cheered me up a lot. Uh, and it got me reading because, as I said, I have started Gilgamesh and I've already read the introduction of uh, the book on the medieval manuscript. So I'm very happy with my book haul and it pre, um, yeah, yeah, it works for, for, for uh, dealing with stress, buying books. It works. <laughs> it works. So thank you everyone for watching and I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine.